Mm. Hello and welcome to This Is Us. I'm Becca King-Reed and this week we're downtown in Santa Cruz at Marini's Candies. The Marini family has been making candies and other sweet treats for about a hundred years and today they're going to share with us how they make some of those tasty confections like chocolate covered bacon and how they stay on candy's cutting edge. We'll also meet some other foodies. Forced to flee his homeland in 1975, Chef Fon's slanted door restaurant has been hailed by critics as the best Vietnamese dining experience in America and the best young international chef in the world who's from right here in Santa Cruz. And finally, what's food without music? Greg Kinn tells us how his brief career as a chart topper led to his second career in radio. We've got some great stories to share and it all starts now. This is us. Welcome back to Marini's in downtown Santa Cruz. I'm with Nick Marini, and Nick, you are a fourth generation now. Your business has been here for nearly 100 years. Tell us how you got started, or how your family started. Sure, it has been almost 100 years. Uh, my great-grandfather, Victor Marini, came over from Italy through Ellis Island and moved to Jackson, California, and then down to Santa Cruz, uh, where he was a barber in the Casa Del Rey building. And then a spot opened up on the boardwalk here in Santa Cruz, and he jumped over and, and started selling popcorn and nuts. And it all started from, from a popcorn stand, mm -hmm. basically. Now, um, what kind of treats were people interested in in that era? You know, it was a lot more hard candies. Uh, we had like a ribbon candy that they used to sell, uh, a lemon drop type candy that we sold, and then started dipping stuff in chocolate, dried fruits, uh, and mm -hmm. then moved on to our saltwater taffy product in the 20s. Now the saltwater taffy is really your signature. That stuff goes around the world. And uh, tell us a little bit about that uh, machine down there that you've got. Sure, so the saltwater taffy, after we cook it, we pour it on a slab. We then move it to our puller to add some elasticity. And then it goes onto our famous taffy wrapping machine, the Model K Kiss Wrapper. <laughs> now, whenever people come to visit me, I always take them to the boardwalk, especially if they've got little kids, and we march right over to Mernie's to see that happen, and it is fabulous. Now, that machine was pretty expensive in its day. It was. 1929, we found the bill of sale for $1,000. Holy cow. Now that's really something, but it's really, it's really fun to watch. It's a, it was a great investment. It's just entertainment factor alone. <laughs> we'll be back in a minute with the candy bar recipe that came in a dream, but first, we got to have some dinner with the best young international chef in the world, Riley Meehan. My senior year of high school, I got a scholarship that led me to go to the Professional Culinary Institute. And uh, from there, I became the best young chef in the world when I competed in Turkey to represent the United States. And now I'm off to the Culinary Olympics in 2012 with my team. Riley Meehan fell in love with food at an early age. When, when Riley was really, really, really little and he didn't know how to, uh, uh, you know, use the pots and pans and, and, and the stove and oven and all that, he would create in a, in a bowl what he called poison and that was different, different uh, spices. Mm -hmm. And he went through enormous amounts of expensive spices <laughs> making these poisons. And he enjoyed it so much, I couldn't stop him. He would just mix everything together. He was a mixologist, <laughs> just <laughs> go in the drawers and take all the spices out and mix it all together. As much as my parents hated it, I loved mixing together spices, making a mess, and making poison. I, I saw Riley's in interest in, in cooking really exploding as he was uh, watching uh, uh, the cooking shows, mainly the Iron Chef. I remember watching a 24-hour marathon of the Japanese Iron Chef. I literally watched all 24 hours of it, much to my parents' uh, dismay, but I loved it so much and I remember calling up my aunt who's very artistic and just asking her, begging her to make me this, this Morimoto, this Iron Chef costume. I mean, he was just in heaven, Iron Chef for Halloween. The first competition Riley was ever in was um, a pie competition at the Santa Cruz County Fair. And he made this beautiful lattice top peach pie. I remember making the pie and you know, spending 20 minutes, 30 minutes doing each little lattice on the top. That was his first big competition and his first big win. 
Winning the pie contest definitely pushed me to keep competing. And that's exactly what this little Iron Chef did. The first time I met Riley, he was doing uh, the Professional Culinary Institute High School competition. Um, he was kind of, a, kind of a little shy, so he didn't really necessarily stand out at the time. But then his food standed out, and he was able to achieve second place and win, a, a, for the most part, a partial scholarship to come to the Professional Culinary Institute. When I found out that I got this scholarship, I was just overjoyed. It's that validation, you know, those extra hours, extra minutes in the kitchen, they really paid off. Oh, when I found out Riley got the scholarship, it was just like, oh my gosh. It was just, it was amazing. I had one of the best experiences of my life at culinary school, and it's something that I would never trade. When he was in school, he was exactly kind of his, the attitude that you see in him. It's this fun, loving guy, this kind of free spirit. At first, I wasn't sure how serious he would be, um, but then every time you'd kind of knock him down a little something, he would come right back at you. Chef Randy has made me understand how to treat food, and I think that's one of the most important things that a chef can learn. Uh, he has such respect for his ingredients, and I think that that really shows in the outcome, the product. I want to make a smaller size but we're gonna really look for some real crispiness. This week. From culinary school, Riley went on to Istanbul, Turkey for the best young international chef competition. I prepared three courses, an appetizer, an entree, and dessert. And all throughout my preparation, there are three kitchen judges who are watching you. And after you are finished plating up, your food goes out to the nine tasting judges. Once my last course went out, the dessert course, I was so relieved. The anticipation before the awards were given out was something I'd never experienced before. It was, I was shaking, I was nervous, I was excited. I mean, even to be just given this opportunity to be there was something incredible, let alone to win it. Winning the title in Istanbul was a huge deal for, I, I believe for Riley, uh, for a lot of reasons. He was the first American. He was the youngest uh, young cook to ever do this. I think one of the most misunderstood things about cooking competition is how much skill is really involved in it. Judges love to see different knife cuts, different cooking methods, different techniques and skills that go into a dish that a normal diner might not understand how much time or effort really went into making that component for your plate. Next stop for Riley, the 2012 Culinary Olympics in Germany. For the team that we're taking to Germany, there are five members, and I specifically play the role of the pastry chef on the team. To prepare for Germany right now, I basically work on my display, which is a display of desserts. The day of training would pretty much be, we usually start uh, with a meeting in the morning, uh, talking about what we hope to accomplish for the day. They bring their original ideas uh, based on their last critique from our last practice session, and they go back in the kitchen and remake it. It's very grueling on the, on the individual. When I get to Germany, I'm hoping to see the best food I've ever seen in my entire life, and I just can't wait to be among other chefs who are as dedicated to their profession as I am. My wish for Riley for the Olympics, um, well, I wish that he would win. <laughs> Welcome back to downtown Santa Cruz, Marini's Candy Store with Gino Marini this time. And Gino, you must have done something fabulous in a former life to land in a family of candy makers. Yeah, I'm pretty fortunate, you know, being a fourth generation candy maker, it's a lot of fun. Uh, my great grandfather started the business and, you know, it's been passed down through the years and now I'm here and with my brother and uh, we're having a blast. <laughs> When you were kids, was, was your, your place the place to be for Halloween? Yeah, my grandparents' house was uh, the place to be. They had you know hundreds to thousands of kids lined up every year. <laughs> They'd come up. Uh, they would give out cotton candy to every kid that came up. Uh, my grandfather was out there spinning it by himself, and then he would let everybody go inside of his house, and my grandmother would be in there, and they would uh, hand out candy bars, full-size candy bars to every kid also. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun for sure. Now you've made your own candy bar and probably plenty of candies, but tell me about this special one. Yeah, one night I was sleeping, woke up in the middle of the night, probably two in the morning, and got a pad of, pen, uh, pad of paper out and a pencil and uh, wrote it down. I aptly named it the Dream Bar after my dream. <laughs> it was a uh, graham cracker crust in the bottom, peanut butter fudge, Rice Krispies, caramel, and dipped in chocolate. So oh, it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. That sounds very yummy. Yeah, it, you know, it, being a candy store owner, you know, it's nice to be able to come up with ideas and put them into action. What's your most unusual idea so far? 
Uh, the most unusual idea we've done is probably chocolate covered crickets, but those didn't last very long. There was a few people that, that liked them, but overall that wasn't something that sold very well. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. Yeah, I don't know exactly, <laughs> for sure. Also, one thing I'm trying to do right now is get a little more spice into our chocolate. So we've made a dark chocolate mango bark with the ghost pepper powder in it, and uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty spicy, though. That sounds like a dare. Yeah, it is. There's a lot of people come in, try it out, and I've actually seen a few people cry after they've eaten it. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of fun stuff. We'll be back in a minute with more from Marini's, but first we're going to meet a rock and roller who's turned his love of music and gift for storytelling into a career on the radio. The deepest lyrics I've ever written are, uh, 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 uh. You're listening to The Greg Kin Show on 98.5 KFOS. Did I ever tell you about the time I was on French TV and I was in the makeup room with Boy George oh, oui. and Eartha Kitt? You might recognize him during your morning drive. But he was first famous for using his voice this way. We had broken up for good just an hour before. Greg Kinn has come a long way from rock star to radio disc jockey. There a few times I agreed with Yoko. <laughs> Go, baby, go. Anyway, yeah. we never thought about being big rock stars. You know, when I started the Greg Kinn Band, we just wanted a you know, place to play. Despite his roller coaster ride of stardom, Kinn has had the good fortune of sustaining a career in a temperamental industry. If you want to really make it big, find something you're good at that's fun and make that your career. Born in Baltimore and raised in a literary household, Greg's gift of gab was formed early on thanks to his father. He used to quote Shakespeare at the dinner table. And, and he used to read Robert's service poems to me and my sister. But it was his mother who saw his musicality. My mom found a guitar in the alley behind our house. It was cracked. I played it enough with enough credibility to my mother goes, you know, let's buy him a guitar. With well, a nudge from mom, Greg was well on his way. My mom sent one of the tapes of a song that I had written into the local radio station, WCAO in Baltimore. It was a talent contest, and I won. Ken packed his bags for California in 1971 and landed in Berkeley, where he formed the Greg Ken Band. When you're in a rock and roll band and you're young and you're just starting out, it is the most fun, because it's you against the world. We would play any gig. I mean, there was one place that we played that paid us in soup. The guy says, well, I don't have any money, but I could give you guys a quart of soup each. <laughs> I took it. In 1976, the Greg Kinn Band recorded their first self-titled album. I was so intimidated that I forgot to do harmony. I had a harmony track on a song I was singing. I forgot to do it. Several albums later, they finally broke with a top 20 single, The Breakup Song. They Don't Write Them, from their 1981 album, Rock Kin Roll. Suddenly we were on solid gold. People were asking for our autographs. God, it was great. Two years later, they landed their biggest hit. I remember where I was and what I was doing when I found out that Jeopardy hit number one. And when your first number one record comes down the pike, it's a very religious experience. We got a pitcher of, uh, of margaritas, we bought some cheap Mexican hats, and we just got plastered. A spoof by Weird Al Yankovic titled, I Lost on Jeopardy, cemented the song's popularity. Al calls up and he says, I want to do a parody. So I'm as happy as a clam. He's got the record, he does the gigs, I get the money, what could be better? But the magic disappeared and the spotlight faded after his next single, Lucky, barely made it on the charts. 
you look in your rock and roll guidebook and it says if your wife's in the video, you got six months. Suddenly you're playing free beer night in Chico. It's not good. When the gigs dried up, I'll tell you, here's a real good uh, gauge. Did your record company just drop you? Can you not get a gig? Are you getting divorced? Is bankruptcy in your future? These are signs. Perhaps it's time for a career change. Ken avoided being a rock and roll statistic by going back to what he knew best. I started writing novels. The first novel, Horror Show, was nominated for a Bram Stoker Award, so I knew I was on the right path there. Greg went from pinning lyrics to publishing novels, and he hasn't looked back since. To me, there was life after rock and roll. You went up, you came down, okay, now what? Ken's can-do attitude led to a gig on San Jose's classic rock station, KFOX. Let's face it, I I love to, I'm full of crap and I love to yak and... You know, they put me on the air. It's like a match made in heaven. The uh, cameras from KTEH are here. They're just filming a little bit of our uh, morning show for one of their shows, and it's kind of fun. Except that Greg has held the most coveted spot on the airwaves for over a decade. To be on the radio every morning here on KFOX, it's like a dream job. I love being part of the fabric of San Jose. I feel like we're all family. I know most of my fans, and, and I like them. All right, man. My next uh, event will be this weekend at the Troop Fest. Now, you know I'm a big supporter of the troops, and I love those guys, especially Operation Care and Comfort, and they're going to be out there. Operation Care and Comfort raises funds to support local military families and sends care packages to troops overseas. Come by, make a donation, maybe pack a thing or two, or just enjoy the bands and have a good time. Ken's contribution had a karmic effect. John Leguizamo rekindled the breakup song when it was featured in actor-director Ed Burns' 2006 film, The Groomsman. My head swelled up to like a watermelon. I was so, I almost jumped up in the theater and said, hey, everybody, that's my song. But I didn't. Never missing a beat, Greg has parlayed his radio gig into a syndication deal, has a new album out, and is working on a film. From rocker to writer to radio DJ, Greg Kinn's career looks like it'll never be in jeopardy. I was lucky. I'll tell you, I've been lucky left and right here. Welcome back. This is the moment you've been waiting for. We're going to find out the story behind chocolate-covered bacon. So, Nick, that you guys are really trendsetters, and this and the chocolate-covered bacon started first at Marini. So, tell us a little bit about it. It did. It did. We uh, about three and a half years ago, my cousin Joe Marini the third actually came up with the chocolate-covered bacon. Uh, kicked the idea around with some friends of his and, and came into the store one afternoon and started dipping it and it's definitely picking up full steam right now. So, so I know people love this stuff. How, how much bacon do you sell like at Christmas? Oh boy, I'd say over you know the whole month of December we're making between 80 and 100 pounds a day and, <laughs> and shipping that all over the United States. So. That is amazing. That is really something. Now you've gone on and, uh, and you have uh, derivatives of the chocolate covered bacon. What are you doing with that? Uh, we have different styles. So we have right now we're dipping our milk chocolate covered bacon, our dark chocolate covered bacon. We do a milk bacon with a maple fudge that we make drizzled on top. And then uh, now we're doing a spicy chocolate covered bacon with a ghost pepper that we import. Oh, that sounds really good. Um, I was at the back door waiting for lights to be set up. The ice cream man came and he rolled in the vegan's nightmare. <laughs> Another one of my cousin's creations, uh, it's actually a maple ice cream with bits of our homemade chocolate covered bacon in it. It has its following, it's not for all, but it's very popular. <laughs> so when did you start making candy? Shoot, I think, you know, back in the early 80s when I was probably 9 or 10, started wrapping taffy. Uh, we opened our wharf location when I was 11 and was their opening day scooping ice cream for customers. Oh, that's really something. So you've been making candy pretty much your whole life? Pretty much my whole life. Even younger than that, you know, summers, dad was pretty busy down at the store, so we grew up at the boardwalk. Ooh, tough. <laughs> yeah, it was rough, rough life. Video games, 
and, and all the and candy tapping. you can eat. Exactly. <laughs> Did your friends figure you would come to school with like a lunchbox full of candy? Yeah, I think everybody always assumed that I had, you know, candy in my backpack or in our shelves and cabinets at home, but it's not really the way it was. We kept work at work and home at uh, home. So the key to success. Yeah. Finally tonight, we'd like to share the story of a gifted man who was forced to flee Vietnam as a youngster and who is now one of the Bay Area's top chefs. Award-winning, acclaimed chef, Charles Bon has been firing up the Bay Area's culinary scene for almost two decades. I had this idea in my head for a long time, 10 years, of really doing my food. He opened his doors in 1995 and instantly garnered a loyal following. His mission? Elevate the Asian food dining experience. I saw a niche. I come from service. I work in a fancy restaurant. Uh, I see how it works. I am comfortable in service. Charles's instincts paid off. The slanted door sizzled with success. But he was no overnight sensation. Bon's journey began an ocean away. His childhood was spent in Dalat, Vietnam, a city heavily influenced by the French. I barely remember, but mom took me to a French restaurant and uh, everybody ordered like the casserole and, and I was the only guy that ordered the lobster. Bon's sophisticated palate was evident early on. I started drinking when I was in like five years old. Uh, coffee, I, I mean, not drinking alcohol. Uh, grandmother would let me dip my cookie into her coffee and dad had a general store, so I was grinding coffee. That was my job. Charles's idyllic upbringing came to a halt when the fall of Saigon forced his family to flee Vietnam on April 30th, 1975. You know, middle of the night, smuggle out, and when we got to international water, they let us out, and we were bobbing around for about seven days. Bon's family landed in Guam and spent two years on the island shores before finally leaving for America. In 1977, Charles arrived in the U.S. and had a rude awakening. We got to San Francisco at four in the morning on Jones and Gary. And back then, you know, it was like, you know, the lady worked the street and it was all over. There was tons of people, car lights, and you just went to shock. And the apartment was a little I was like, oh, God. A two studio for 11 people, that was a little much. We used to take a bed and pick it up and move it over. So you had the, pla the box frame and the mattress and, and all the men on one room and the whole in the other room. And uh, that didn't last too long. The family moved to Chinatown, but still faced the many challenges of immigrant life. My dad gone from you know, upper middle class to mopping people's floor. Dad got a job. Um, as a janitor with an English pub, and I was exposed to restaurant. A year later, I was busing table. Fon went on to study architecture at UC Berkeley, but his artistic nature led him back to the kitchen. Inspired by the simplicity and freshness of places like Chez Panisse and Zuni Cafe, Charles wanted to introduce Vietnamese cuisine in the same manner. All right, just figure out how to cook six things, because that's all they got, six things on the menu. And most Chinese restaurants got about 120. Marrying design with high quality ingredients, his innovative concept introduced Americans to modern Vietnamese cuisine. In 2000, a visit by President Clinton solidified his place in the culinary world. They come on a Sunday unannounced. They say they're from a church group. They want a table for 25. And it's like, we don't have table for 25 in two hours. You get here, you get here. Next thing you know, sharpshooters on the roof, the whole block got shut down. I was on my way to work. President Clinton came in and ate. Uh, the layout is pretty much the same, but, but this is pretty much where Clinton sat. It was a huge honor to have a president eat your food. I mean, it's really humbling. And one of the things I, I feel most proud of, it's just, you know, being immigrant and being Asian, sometimes you feel a little chip on the shoulder saying people don't take you seriously on the design world, your food. These days, Fun's multi-million dollar enterprise is serious business. His seven restaurants pepper the city's landscape and serve almost 1,000 meals a day. The Slanted Door's current location sits on prime real estate, anchoring the historic ferry building. On any given day, you'll find a combination of movers and shakers from the financial district and eager tourists vying for a seat. 
and it's been amazing, you know. I mean, I would never imagine where we are today. Is this you? Okay, in that case, I'm okay. <laughs> Charles Bunn has come a long way, from washing dishes to dishing with the elite. A celebrated chef, Bunn has cemented his status with an appearance on the granddaddy of all culinary shows, the Food Network's famed Iron Chef series, battling it out with fellow Bay Area chef, Cat Cora. Here we go. They're related to broccoli and Fueled by his passion for sustainability, Charles was also featured in the PBS series Chefs Afield, teaching his children the importance of knowing where their food comes from. For a century, you know, there's a collaboration between the farmer and the chef. I think if you're honest and you bring value to the, to the table, people will appreciate that. One item you won't find on the menu is this comfort food dish. One of my favorite at home, last minute uh, steamed spare rib with a, it's called tong choy, it's like a preserved vegetable. And all you gotta do is just boil it for about, you know, two minutes or so. So now we're gonna marinate it. 30 minutes steaming, get some rice going, uh, sa saute some vegetable, you really have a meal. Vaughn has really raised the culinary bar. He was recognized with the prestigious James Beard Award for Best Chef California 2011. It makes me happy for, you know, my people, for the country, for Vietnam. With a slew of restaurants under his belt, a new cookbook on the way, and his charity work, this humble visionary is truly living the American dream. But really, at the end of the day, you know, uh, you know, at my funeral, I want people to say, you know, I made a difference. He really tried, you know. He might not be good, but he tried. <laughs>well, we have to say goodnight, but we can't go until we talk about the fabulous fudge that's made here. This is another one of your signature items, right? It is, it is. This is our uh, locally famous Marini's Made Fudge, uh, made by Lisa out at our wharf location, and I have some of our peanut butter explosion for you to try. Oh, well, gosh, this is, this is such a tough job. Oh, that is really good. That is very good. Even the chocolatey part tastes like peanut butter. It's excellent. Well. Thank you so much for letting us come into your candy store. We're so excited to have been here. For all of us at This Is Us, and for Nick and Gino, I'm Becca King-Reed saying good night.